drink beer, it's good for you. I'm empty handed and I'm feeling blue, and I'm gonna drink till the day that I die. Hello, and welcome to the video. In this video, I'll be sharing a very special beer recipe that is probably mostly unheard of outside of Norway, but I feel this is something special that is worth sharing with you all. This special beer is a Norwegian harvest ale that was offered by a leading craft brewery here in Norway. It is certainly a very refreshingly fruity and floral ale with a modest background of smoky flavour. This beer is extremely well balanced with high drinkability. Apparently this beer recreates a traditional Norwegian harvest ale very well. On the Rate Beer website it has obtained an overall rating of 90 out of 100, with 97 out of 100 for style. Impressive numbers. I have been given special permission by the brewery to share their homebrew version of this recipe. And I actually obtained this recipe in a kit from a Norwegian retailer brew shop, and they tell me this kit is very popular. If you live outside Norway but would still like to obtain this kit, then they're very open to export, so just contact them at brewshop.no. Let's have a look at this beer style. So this beer is in a similar family to the Saison beer style, which I'm sure you will realise is very, very wide open. So it is really going to be foolish of me to narrow it down too much. As with farms from across the world producing beers for harvest, they would have simply used what they had, so as such there is no real roadmap for this style. In modern day brewing of these styles, all sorts of different modern day malts can be used. Base malts will usually include Pau malt, Pilsner malt, Vienna malt and wheat, along with Munich. The base malt will usually be around half of the grist, but sometimes more. It is also common to see all sorts of speciality grain used these days with this style. Rye, biscuit and smoked malts really work well. Having said all of this, there is also a belief with some in Norway that a simple grain bill of 50% Pilsner to 50% Pau malt with a single 15 IBU hop addition at the start of the boil works just great for this style. This allows the yeast to dominate, of course. More on this later. In modern day Norwegian farmhouse brewing, all sorts of different hops are used, but the main piece of advice that I can give you is that this is traditionally not a hop forward style, but one that relies on malt and yeast flavour. In olden days Norway, farmers were required by law to produce a beer and could lose their land if this duty was neglected. The Norwegian legal requirement was for a thirst quenching owl that had plenty of flavour. It is felt that in Norway that their harvest owls had more flavour from malt and yeast compared to similar style owls produced in farms in other countries. Part of this was due to the very fruity farmhouse yeast available in Norway, which is known as kveik, but also because the law was serious about the owl having plenty of flavour. If you can obtain a kveik yeast from Norway for this style, then you are really going to be creating this completely two style. There is a Facebook group where you can obtain this yeast in its true form, and I have the group name on screen now. Yes, the title is in Norwegian, but the people in this group are very friendly and happy to use English. If you do not wish to take this route, then a Saison yeast would also work, but of course it won't be the same and it definitely won't be as fruity. For those of you who are unfamiliar with Kveik, then please check out my Norwegian Farmhouse Owls playlist on this channel. This yeast is certainly not something to miss. It usually has a 1-3 to three day fermentation time, an extremely short conditioning time, even for strong beers, and is available with different flavour profiles including almost neutral. Due to the amount of varieties available of this yeast, it can actually be used with many different styles of beer, outside of Saison types also. So here is the brewery's recipe. Keep in mind that this is of 22 litres, or 5.81 US gallons. If you wish to brew a different amount, then please scale it using a beer calculator, as when it comes to the hop content of this recipe, it is not simple multiplication or division. I have a guide on this channel on how to do this using the free Grainfather recipe tools. Another thing to be aware of is that the hops that I have used are probably not going to have the same alpha acid percentage as yours. 
Within the recipe, we'll find that I'm showing my hops alpha acid percentages and also the intended IBU of the addition. You will need to use a beer calculator to match your hops IBU to mine for each addition. As always, this recipe is shared in this video's description and also on the Grain Farver Recipe Tools database. It is much easier to find my recipes on that database by typing in my name, David Heath, rather than the recipe title. Let's now look at this recipe in a bit more detail. This recipe uses Pilsner malt as its base malt at 51% of the grist. I can see that this choice was made so that the other malts will shine through more and as such Pilsner is there as a low flavour base that will provide gravity. Next at 15% of the grist is Munich malt. This will provide some more sweeter flavour notes and will blend in well with the smoked malt that we also have at 15% of this grist. Do understand that not all smoked malts are the same. I would highly suggest using a smoked malt that is formulated for use in German beer styles like Rauch beer that can be used at the rate of 100% of the grist. Some smoked malts are much heavier in flavour and even at 15% could really swamp this recipe. You will find this smoked effect will come out much larger in the early life of this beer than later on. You will find that the smoked effect of the smoked malt that different malt houses offer is also different. Some will so offer more than one. So it was worth having a good read to see what you can obtain and choose the effect of the best one that suits your individual taste buds. Coming in at 9% of this grain bill we have rye malt. Rye is an ancient grain that was used in a lot of old beer styles, basically because of the fact that it was very easy to grow even in very bad conditions. Used at the amount we have in this recipe, rye will give an enhancement to the beer's complexity of flavour. You will experience a slight level of spiciness and a change in texture. Used in large quantities, then it can really have a very overpowering and overwhelming effect. Also like wheat, it can certainly give filtration issues. For these reasons, most commercial breweries stick with a limitation of 20% of rye in a given grain bill. Lastly, grain-wise, we have two different types of crystal malt. Crystal malts have various functions as follows. Firstly, the use of crystal malt is one of the easiest ways to add sweet flavours to a beer. Generally, this will be caramel-like in taste. Hence why crystal malt is also commonly referred to as caramel malt in some nations. Also, crystal malt will add colour, provide mouthfeel and head retention. In this brew we have two different types which will aid with some variation of this flavour. If you cannot obtain exactly the same EBC ratings for both of these, then do not worry. Just be sure to use two different types of crystal malts that are low in EBC or colour. There are two different types of hops used in this brew. While this is not a hoppy beer at all, as such, they do play a valuable role in balancing the beer's sweetness with bitterness and adding some nice flavours along the way. Firstly, we have Columbus. This hop is also known as Tomahawk. You will also find that this is very much like Zeus. This hop is herbal and spicy with a light citrus flavour. You will experience a nice earthy citrus aroma for beers that use this hop. The bitterness from this hop is very neutral, which is useful in styles like this one where we want other flavours to sign through other than just the hops. Secondly, we have Centennial hops. Like Columbus, this hop imparts earthy and subdued citrus flavours and aromas, but also brings a floral note along to the party that is a nice element of this bear's flavour and aroma profile. If you cannot obtain exactly these two hops, then there are some alternatives that I'm showing on screen now. You may also notice that in some hop substitution charts, that Columbus can also substitute for Centennial. For this brew, I would suggest using two different hops for the intended effect of this recipe to shine. The last element of this brew is of course the yeast. The brewery themselves naturally used a fake yeast strain. I would urge you to try this. If not, then I've suggested a Saison style of yeast in the recipe with fermentation instructions. Before I move on to video footage of my brew of this beer, here are some other videos on this channel that you may find useful.
If you are new to Grainfather Brewing, then the Grainfather Quick Start Guide should be helpful in bringing you up to speed quickly. If you are looking for something quick to brew for Christmas, then my Christmas American Porter may appeal, and has instructions for Christmas and other times of the year. If you are experiencing problems with stuck sparging, then my guide here will get you out of trouble for the future. And lastly, if you are confused about how much water to use during your brew, then check out my water volumes video for various solutions to help out. OK, let's move on to the brew. The mash took a little while to clear up because of that rye, but once it did, it certainly was a sight to behold. It's fair to say that this boil showed an awful lot of protein, but once this was stirred into the boil, this very nice colour was revealed. I well poured to promote clarity for about 5 minutes, and then did a 15 minute hop stand. I am using Jana's Voskveik yeast for fermentation, and had some cold tapped juggling fun to get my wort to this high fermentation temperature. Once all of the wort was transferred I gave it a 5 minute drill blasting for aeration. All had gone very well brew wise and I pitched my fake. All there is to do now is wait for fermentation. This particular kvake usually takes three days for fermentation, but I tend to leave transfer until it's been in for about a week or so. I have found that this extra time really benefits kvake in the same way that it does regular yeast, but naturally it's a far shorter period. Anna's Vos kvake is one of the more popular strains out there, and it really contributes a beautiful fruity taste, as well as fermenting and conditioning in super fast times. Be aware that the commercial version made by the Yeast Bay is not actually a proper quake, as it is a single isolated strain. The real dill version is several strains together. Once I have bottled this, then it will be very conditioned by the time I have carbonation and ready to be enjoyed in pig state. So there you have it, this concludes this video. I do hope you found it to be interesting, useful and enjoyable. Do let me know. So if you did like this video, then please do like it on YouTube. This really helps me out and allows the videos to be seen by a wider audience on YouTube. I have always got a lot of new videos planned for the future, so if you are interested in seeing my new content, then please subscribe for future content. If you have any questions on anything that I have covered in this video, or any other video, then please do not hesitate to get in touch with me via YouTube or Facebook. I'm a member of pretty much every Grainfather Facebook group and more. Happy brewing!